Chapter Thirteen of the Abominations of Modern Society. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kevin Davidson. The Abominations of Modern Society by Thomas Dewitt Talmage. The gun that kicks over the man who shoots it off. Blasphemy is a crime that aims at God but does its chief harm to the one that fires it off. So I compare it to a piece of imperfect firearms, to which the marksman puts his eye, and pulling the trigger by the rebound finds himself in the dust. I tell you a story, oriental and marvelous. History speaks of the richest man in all the East. He had camels, oxen, asses, sheep, and what would make any man rich even if he had nothing else, seven sons and three daughters. It was the custom of this man's children to have family reunions. One day he is at home, thinking of his darling children who are keeping banquet at their elder brother's house. Yonder comes a messenger, in hot haste, evidently from his looks bearing evil tidings. Recovering himself sufficiently to speak, he says, The oxen and the asses have been captured by a foraging party of Sabaeans, and all the servants are butchered except myself another messenger is coming he says that the sheep and the shepherds have been struck by lightning another messenger is coming he says that the chaldeans have come and captured the camels and killed all but himself another messenger who says while thy sons and daughters were at the feast a hurricane struck at the corner of the tent and they are all dead but his misfortunes are not yet completed the old man is smitten with the elephantiasis or black leprosy tumors from head to foot face distorted forehead ridged with offensive tubercles eyelashes fall out nostrils excoriated voice destroyed intolerable exhalation from the whole body until with none to dress his sores he sits down in the ashes with nothing but broken pieces of pottery to use in the surgery of his wounds at this point when he needed all consolation and encouragement his wife comes to him and says virtually, This is intolerable. Our property gone, our children slain, and now this loathsome, disgusting disease is upon you. Why don't you swear? Curse God and die. But profanity would not have removed one tumor from his agonized body, would not have brought to his door one of the captured camels, would not have restored any one of the dead children. Swearing would have made the pain more unbearable the pauperism into which he had plunged more distressing, the bereavement more excruciating. And yet, from the swearing and blasphemy with which our land is cursed, one would think that there were some great advantage to be reaped from the practice. There is to-day in all our land no more prevalent custom and no more God-defying abomination than profane swearing. You can hardly walk our streets five minutes without having your ears stung and your sensibilities shocked. The drayman swearing at his horse, the tin man at his solder, the sewing girl imprecating her tangled thread, the bricklayer cursing at his trowel, the carpenter at his plane, the sailor at the tackling, the merchant at the customer, the customer at the merchant, the printer at the miserable proof sheet, the accountant at the troublesome line of figures swearing in the cellar and in the loft before the counter and behind the counter in the shop and on the street in low saloon and fashionable bar-room children swear men swear ladies swear profanity from the lowest haunt calling upon the almighty to the fashionable o lord of the glittering drawing-room this whole country is blasted with the evil coming from the west a gentleman sat behind two persons conversing profanities were so frequent in the conversation of the two persons in front that the gentleman behind took out his pencil and paper and made a record the profanities filled several sheets in the course of two days at the close of which time the gentleman handed the manuscript to the persons conversing the men said is it possible that we have uttered so many profanities in the course of two days the gentleman said yes then said one of the men i shall never swear again I make no abstract discussion. I hate abstractions. I'd rather come right out and have a talk with you about a habit that you admit to be wrong. 
This habit has grown from the fact that the young often think it an evidence of manliness. There are thousands of boys and youth who indulge in it. I hear children along the street, but just able to walk, practicing this iniquity. They cannot talk straight, but they can get enough distinctness to let you know that they are damning their own souls and the souls of others. Oh, it is horrible to see a little child, the first time it lifts its feet to walk, set them down on the burning pavement of hell. Between sixteen and twenty years of age there is apt to come a time when a young man is as much ashamed of not being able to deliver an oath as he is of the dizziness that comes from his first cigar. He has his hat and coat and boots of the right pattern, and there is but one thing more now to bring him into fashion, and that is a capacity to swear. So there are some of our young men surrounded by an atmosphere of profanities. Oaths sit on their lips, they roll under their tongues and nest in the shock of hair. In elegant drawing-rooms they abstain from such utterances, but fill club-room and street with their immoralities of speech. You suggest the wrongfulness of the habit, and they thrust their fingers in the sleeve of their vest and swagger and say, Who cares? They have no regard for God, but great respect for the ladies. Ah, there is no manliness in that. The most ungentlemanly thing a man can do is to swear. This habit is becoming more and more prevalent because of the immorality of parents and employers. There are very many fathers who indulge in this habit. They feel moved to utter themselves in this way, but first look around to see if their children are present. They have no idea that their children know everything about it. The probability is that if you swear, your children swear. They were in the next room and heard you, or somebody told them about your habit. Your child is practicing to do just as you do. He is laughed at, at first, for his awkwardness, but after a while he will swear as well as you. Then look at the example of master carpenters, masons, roofers, and hatters. You know how some of you go around the building, and when the work of your journeymen and subordinates does not please you, what do you say? It is not praying, is it? Forthwith your journeymen and subordinates learn the habit. Hence our hat shops and house scaffoldings and sidewalks and wharves and dockyards and cellars and lofts ring with blasphemies. Men argue that if it is right for a man worth fifty or a hundred thousand dollars to swear, it can be overlooked in men who have merely their day's wages. Because they are poor, must they be denied this one luxury? This habit becomes more prevalent because of the infirmities of temper. There are many men who, when at peace, are most fastidious of speech, but when aroused into the violence of passion, blaze with imprecation. The Oriental's wife, spoken of, would not have liked her husband to be profane under ordinary circumstances, but now that the camels are gone, and the sheep are gone, and the property is gone, and the boils have come, she says, Why don't you swear? Curse God and die. Others, all the year round, have not the froth of profanity wiped from their lips, but try to expend all the fury of a twelve-month in one red-hot paragraph of five minutes. A man apologized for his occasional swearing by saying that, once in a year, in this way, he cleared himself out. There are men who have no control of their blasphemous utterances, who want us to send them to Congress. Others have blasphemed in senatorial places, pretending afterwards that it was a mere rhetorical flourish. Many fall into the habit, through the frequent use of what are called bywords. I suppose that all have favorite phrases of this kind in which there is no harm but a profusion of this style of speech often ends in bald profanity it is i declare my stars mercy on me good gracious by george by jove and by heavens and no harm is intended but it is a very easy transition from this kind of talk to that which is positively obnoxious the English language is magnificent, and capable of expressing every shade of feeling and every degree of energy and zeal, and there is no need that we take to ourselves unlawful words. If you are happy, Noah Webster offers your tongue ten thousand epithets in which you may express your exhilaration, and if you are righteously indignant, there are in this dictionary whole armories of denunciation and scorn, sarcasm and irony, caricature and wrath. 
utter yourself against some meanness or hypocrisy and all the blasphemies that ever smoked up from perdition and i will go on to denounce the same meanness and hypocrisy with a hundredfold more stress and vehemency in words across which no slime has ever trailed and through which no infernal fires have shot their forked tongues words pure innocent all impressive god honored anglo-saxon in which milton sang and bunyan dreamed and shakespeare wrote but whatever be the source of this habit it is on the increase at sixteen boys swear with as much facility as the grandfather did at sixty our streets are cursed by it from end to end our hotels from morning until midnight resound with it men curse on the way to the bar to get their morning dram curse the newsboy who cries the paper curse the breakfast for being cold curse at the bank curse at the store curse on the way to bed curse at the stone against which they strike their foot and curse at the splinter that gets under the nail if you do not know that this is so it is because your ear has been hardened by the perpetual din of profanities that are enough to bring down upon any city the hurricane of fire that consumes sodom the habit is creeping up into the higher circles every woman despises flat and unvarnished imprecations but in the most elevated circles there are women who swear without knowing it they have read bulwer and george sand and the exaggerated style of some of our imported as well as homemade periodical literature till they do not actually know what is decency of speech with fairy fan to their lips they utter their oaths and under chandeliers which discover not the faintest blush recklessly speak of the holiest of names this is helped on by the second glass of wine that is perfectly harmless and though no one dare charge her being so finely dressed with anything like intoxication yet there comes a glassiness to the eye and a glow to the cheek and a style of speech to the tongue that were not known before she took the second glass that was perfectly harmless one wild terrific wave of blasphemy is sweeping over the land see the effects of this widespread profanity and the increasing perjury if men in ordinary conversation so commonly use the name of god is it wonderful that in the jury box and in the alderman's office and in the custom house so many swear falsely notice the way an oath is administered they toss the bible at a man and in the most trivial way say so help you god kiss the book i suppose enough lies are every day told in the custom house to sink it smuggling although it be done against positive oath is in some circles considered a grand joke and you say some day to your friend how can you sell those goods so cheaply and your friend says with an eye twinkle the custom house tariff was not as high on those things as it might have been men more easily break their solemn oaths than formerly what strange verdicts juries do sometimes render what peculiar charges do judges sometimes make what unaccountable slowness sheriffs and their deputies sometimes exhibit in the execution of their writs what erratic railroad enterprises suddenly pass at our state capitals what wonderful changes congress makes in the tariff on liquors what is an oath anything solemn anything appealing to the almighty anything stupendous in man's history no it is kissing the book in a land where the name of god so often becomes the football of what are called respectable circles how can we expect that it can excite any veneration when in the presence of county clerk or alderman or judge or legislative assembly it is used in solemn adjuration this habit lowers bedwarfs and destroys the entire moral nature you might as well expect to raise harvests and vineyards on the side of belching stromboli as to have any great excellency grow upon your soul when it so often overflows with the scoria of this awful propensity you will never swear yourself up you will swear yourself down the mohammedans when they find a slip of paper they cannot read put it aside for fear the name of god is on it that you say is one extreme we go to the other you are willing to acknowledge this a miserable habit and would like to have some recipe for its cure reflect much upon the uselessness of the habit did a volley of oath ever start a heavy load did curses ever unravel a tangled skein 
Did they ever extirpate the meanness of a customer? Did they ever collect a bad debt? Did they ever cure a toothache? Did they ever stop a twinge of the gout? Did they ever save you a dollar, or put you a step forward in any great enterprise, or enable you to gain a position, or to accomplish anything that you ever wanted to do? How much did you ever make by swearing? What, in all the round of a lifetime of profanity, did you ever gain by the habit? Reflect also upon the fact that it arouses God's indignation. The Bible reiterates in paragraph after paragraph and chapter after chapter the fact that all swearers and blasphemers are accursed now and are to be forever miserable. There is no iniquity that has been so often visited with the immediate curse of God. At New Brunswick a young man was standing on the railroad track, blaspheming. The cars passed, and he was found on the track with his tongue cut out. People could not understand how, with comparatively little bruising to the rest of his body, his tongue could have been cut out. Not long ago, in Chicago, a man told a falsehood, and said that he hoped, if what he said was not true, God would strike him dead. He instantly fell. There was no longer any pulse. There was no reason for his death except that he had asked God to strike him dead, and God did it. In Scotland a club was formed in which the members competed as to which could use the most horrid oaths. The man who succeeded best in the infamy was made president of the club. His tongue began to swell. It protruded from his mouth. He could not draw it in. He died within three days. Physicians were astounded. There was nothing like it in all the books. What was the matter with him? He cursed God and died. Near Catskill, New York, during a thunderstorm, a group of men were standing in a blacksmith's shop. There came a crash of thunder, and the men were startled. One man said that he was not afraid, and he made a wager that he dared to go out in front of the shop, while the lightning were flying, and dared the Almighty. He went out, shook his fist at the heavens, crying, Strike me if you dare. Instantly a thunderbolt struck him. He was dead. He cursed God and died. God will not abide this sin. He will not let it escape. There is a kind of manifold paper by which man may, with a heavy pencil, write upon a dozen sheets at once, the writing going down through all the sheets. So every oath and blasphemy goes through, and is written indelibly on every leaf of God's remembrance. Ah, how much our Father bears! Can you make an estimate of how many blasphemies will roll up from the streets and saloons of our cities to-night? If you go out and look up, you cannot see them. There will be no trail of fire on the sky, but the air is full of them. The name of Christ is not so often spoken in worship as in derision. God will be cursed to-night by hundreds of lips. The grog-shops will curse him. The houses of shame will curse him. Five points will curse him. Bedford Street will curse him. Chestnut Street will curse him. Madison Square will curse him. Beacon Street will curse him. Every street in all our cities will curse him. This blasphemy is an abomination that no words of mine can describe, and God hears it. They curse his name, they curse his Sabbath, they curse his Bible, they curse his people, they curse his only begotten Son. Yes, they swear by the name of Jesus. It makes my hair rise, and my flesh creep, and my blood chill, and my breath catch, and my foot halt. Dionysius had a cave where men were incarcerated. At the top of the cave was an aperture to which he could put his ear, and could hear every sigh, every groan, every word of the inmates. This world is so arranged that all its voices go up to heaven. God puts down his ear, and hears every word of praise offered, and every word of blasphemy spoken. Our cities must come to judgment. All these oaths must be answered for. They die on the air, but they have an eternal echo. Listen for the echo. It rolls back from the ages to come. Listen. All blasphemers shall have their place in the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone. Some have thought that a lost soul in the future world will do that which it was most prone to do in this world. If so, then think of a man blaspheming God through all eternity. This habit grows upon a man, until at last it pushes him off forever. I saw a man die with an oath between his teeth. Voltaire rose from his dying pillow, and supposing that he saw Christ in the room, cried out, Crush the wretch! A celebrated officer during the last war fell mortally wounded, and the only word he sent to his wife was, 
Tell her I fought like hell. There are thousands of men who are having their moral nature pulled down by the fiery fingers of this habit. At last, pinched, shriveled, and consumed, they will get down on their beds to die, and at the step of the doctor in the hall, or the shutting of the front door, they will start up, thinking they hear the sepulchral gates creak open. Who is this God that you should maltreat his name? Has he been haunting you, starving you, or freezing you all your life? No, he is your father, patient and loving. He rocked your cradle with blessings from the time you were born. He clothes you now, and has always clothed you. You never had a sickness, but he was sorry for you. He has brooded over you with wings of love. He has tried to press you to his heart of kindness and compassion. He wants to forgive you. He wants to help you. He wants to make you happy. He watched last night over your pillow while you slept. He will watch tonight. He was your father's God and your mother's. He has housed them safe from the blast, and he wants to shelter you. Do you trifle with his name? Do you smite him in the face? Do you thrust him back by your imprecations? Who is this Jesus Christ that I hear men swearing by? Who is he? Some destroyer that they so treat his name? What foul thing has he done that our great cities speak his name in thousand-voiced jeer and contempt? Who is he? A lamb whose blood simmered in the fires of sacrifice to save you, a brother who put down his crown of glory that you might take it up. For many years he has been striving, night and day, to win your affections. There is nothing in heaven that he is not willing to give you. He came with blistered feet and streaming eyes, with aching head and broken heart to relieve you. On the craft of a doomed humanity he pushed out into the sea to pick you off from the rock. Who will ever again malign his name? Is there a hand that will ever again be lifted to wound him? If so, let that hand, blood-dipped, be lifted now. Which one of my readers will ever again utter his sacred name and imprecation? If any, now let them speak. Not one, not one. One summer among the New England hills there was an evening memorable for storm and darkness. The clouds which had been all day gathering at last unlimbered their batteries. The Housatonic that flows in silence, save as the paddles of pleasure parties rattle in the rowlock, was lashed into foam when its waves staggered, not knowing where to lay themselves. The hills jarred at the rumbling of God's chariots. Blinding sheets of rain drove the cattle to the bars and beat against the window pane as if to dash it in. The cornfields crouched in the fury, and the ripened grain fields threw their crowns of gold at the feet of the storm king. After the night shut in, it was a double night. Its black mantle was rent with the lightnings, and into its locks were twisted the leaves of uprooted oaks, and shreds of canvas torn from the masks of the beach shipping. It was such a night as makes you thank God for shelter, and bids you open the door to let in even the spaniel howling outside with the terror. We went to sleep under the full blast of heaven's great orchestra, and the forest with uplifted voice inquiring hosts that filled all the side of the mountains, praising the Lord. We waked not until the fingers of the sunny morn touched our eyelids. We looked out. Housatonic slept as quiet as a baby's dream. Pillars of white clouds set up along the heavens looked like the castles of the blessed, built for the hierarchs of heaven on the beach of the azure sea. The trees sparkled as though there had been some great grief in heaven, and each leaf had been God appointed to catch an angel's tear. It seems as if God, our Father, had looked down upon earth, his wayward child, and stooped to her tear-wet cheek and kissed it. Even so will the darkness of our country's crime and suffering be lifted. God will roll back the night of storm and bring in the morning of joy. Its golden light will gild the city spire and strike the forests of Maine and tinge the masts of Mobile, and with one end resting upon the Atlantic beach and the other on the Pacific coast, God will spring a great rainbow arch of peace in token of everlasting covenant that the land shall never again be deluged with crime. End of chapter 13 Recording by Kevin Davidson www.blogordie.com